Hey guys, I hope you've been doing well this week. So we're back with the last lecture talking about chapter 4 and 5, where Randy talks about his parents. So he talks about his humble beginnings, how it all got started, and how his parents worked as a support network for him, motivating and encouraging him to achieve his dreams like he talks about later. So I got a chance to talk to a couple of professors about their opinions on this subject. So first I got a chance to talk to Professor Whitehead. Hi everyone, I'm here today with Professor Whitehead who's going to talk to us about chapter 4 and 5 of the last lecture and the idea of a support, uh, support network that we looked at. Alright, thank you Jen and welcome to all of you to St. Jerome's in this exciting phase in your life university. Uh, my name is Denise Whitehead and I'm an assistant professor in sexuality, marriage and family studies. Um, but I'm also the parent of two teenage daughters, one in high school and one who just finished her first year at the University of Waterloo. So I speak to you today both as someone who's living her own dreams, but also as someone who is supporting the dreams of her children. In this week's reading, Randy Pouch talks about the importance of family and the critical role his family of origin played in supporting him and his dreams. Sometimes when people look at the success of someone like Professor Pausch, you know, they miss the long history of other people that helped them get there and the ups and downs that they faced along the way. Success is rarely linear, um, but that seems to be something that we're afraid to tell young people. Uh, that there will be successes, but that there will also be failures and that, that it's okay to have that happen. Uh, one of my favorite sayings that I regularly share with my children and my students is this. Success isn't final. Failure isn't fatal. It is the courage to go on. I think this resonates so deeply with me because of the type of parents I had. Like Randy, I was extraordinarily fortunate to be raised by two parents who believed in me. From a young age, my parents looked for ways to enhance my education without ever pressuring me that it had to yield a particular outcome. I went to the most amazing performing arts elementary school where I learned to play the violin, sing, and participate in incredible theatrical productions. Though I didn't know it at the time, uh, this taught me confidence and has given me a skill set that I draw on as a teacher. And at my request, they found the money, and money was tight with me and my three younger brothers to support, to send me to a private Catholic girls' school that I yearned to attend. I loved that school, and I hope my parents know how much I appreciate that they made it possible for me to go to a school that allowed me to flourish and be myself. My parents also gave me permission to dream big, and this is no small thing. My dad is a recently retired university professor, but my mom came from a family where a university education was viewed as a waste for a woman who was going to get married and have children. I am so grateful that my parents never saw me as anything but capable and worthy of every educational opportunity. Uh, when I was a young child, I would ask my dad, what should I be when I grow up? <laughs> and my dad once said, how about the first woman prime minister of Canada? Now I know that's a job since taken, um, but how adorable. Um, he picked a button up one time for me while he was in Ottawa and it said, a woman's place is in the House of Parliament. <laughs> I still have that button. Now when I got a little older, I remember asking my dad, well, how do you become the Prime Minister? And he said, well, you know, you have to be elected as an MP and most of those people usually become lawyers first. I was never told I had to be a lawyer, but a seed had been planted. Now the real test came later. I started university as a four-year scholarship winner and yet, I almost failed out of my first year. Um, it turns out that neither my dad nor I could pass first year chemistry. But you know, this is the important part of my story. I never heard any recriminations from my parents. When I later asked why they hadn't said anything, they reflected that they knew I was harder on myself than anyone and that they knew I needed time. Time to figure out what I was good at and what I wanted to do. And that comes to the piece of advice that I regularly share with my girls. That living life and figuring out who you are is all about time and experience. You can't rush time. Maturation and brain development is built on this foundation. But how you utilize that time is all about experience. Taking different classes, part-time and summer work, volunteering, traveling, like SJU's Beyond Borders program, activities with friends and families, uh, moving out for the first time, falling in love, falling out of love, <laughs> managing loss and achieving success. Now after dusting myself off after my first year, I entered the sociology program and two years later I was admitted to law school. But as I stated earlier, life and careers are rarely linear. There can be curveballs. For me, I loved law but not the practice of law. 
So my career took a detour when I enrolled in a graduate program in family studies going on to complete a master's and PhD. Only this time my efforts were supported by my husband, my two daughters, as well as by my parents. And here I am now pursuing a career I love, doing research in family law, combining all of my education, being called upon to share my research with practitioners and judges across Canada, and teaching diverse courses on everything from relationships to law. I work with lovely colleagues, and I talk with students as they seek to understand who they are and where they are going. I have the best job, and I have my incredible family to thank for cheering me on. And that is what I hope for each of you. Many and diverse opportunities to explore who you are as a person and all your facets, and to realize your dreams and goals, even as they change like a kaleidoscope over time. Because sometimes, the journey carries you to places you had no idea would be so amazing. I wish you all the best in the upcoming year. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Whitehead, again, for joining us. It was amazing hearing your story and your own beginnings, just like Randy's. Next, I got to talk to Professor Serafini about her opinion on the subject as well. Hello, everybody. I'm here today with Professor Serafini. We're going to talk about chapter four and five that we saw in the last lecture and her perspective on the idea of a support network. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> Very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No worries. So what have you thought about the book so far? Well, it's interesting, Jen, because you say, what have I thought so far? I read the entire book. Oh, there you go. Okay. There's no so far, because once I got started, I was like, wow. <laughs> and I just kept, I kept going. So I thought it was, I didn't know anything about the book when mm -hmm. I was asked to be part of it. So I was a bit surprised, a bit mm -hmm. taken aback. I didn't realize it was basically the story of this man's life yeah. um, and that he was dealing with something as, as serious as, as, as cancer, right? Yeah. Um, so I found myself um, uh, doing waves, right? It's and a I, coaster, yeah. yeah, I did wonder what it was like for, uh, what it would be like for students, um, incoming students to read the book who might mm -hmm. have personal uh, connections to chronic illness uh, and cancer in particular. Absolutely, so I wondered yeah. um, what would be happening for them when they read the book. Uh, yeah. So I thought I thought there were so many little pages that I folded. I wanted to put <laughs> stickies everywhere, but I didn't always have them with me when I was reading because there were things I wanted to come back to and to remember. So I thought it was fantastic <laughs> and at times light and made me smile and laugh, and at times quite heavy. Yeah, yeah, he's got a good balance of the two of them. He does. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely sticky noted all over my copy. You There's did. Yes, well there. done. I'm going to go back and reread, and mm. I'm going to sticky note certain areas and write myself little notes. Yeah, because yeah. there's so many good... Lots of gems. It's full. Like, there's so much. Lots of gems, yeah. All right, and so how would you define a support network and the role that it plays for students? I believe support networks are extremely important for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, and students know no more or less than everyone else. Um, it, I'm, a, I'm a clinician by training as well, I'm a couple of family therapist, and one of the things that I, um, I, I, I talk with clients about in my practice is the importance of self-care, mm -hmm. of taking care of oneself, um, of having people around you that uh, you can, you know, talk with, vent with, uh, and even just do things with to take your mind off, you yeah. know, the heaviness of life. So when I was thinking about what that would be like for incoming students in particular, yeah. I mean, university is great. University is fantastic. <laughs> it sure can be. I mean, I, they were the best, I won't say the best years of my life, <laughs> but at the time they felt like the best years of my life. They were amazing. Um, and that said though, they're also challenging and, um, it can be quite a big adjustment. Mm. Um, high school is really different than university, yeah. right? Um, so having a support network and staying connected with people, um, you know, from the past who've been strong for you, and then making new friends and, and acquaintances mm. is, is extremely important. Um, I did a talk on, on main campus once about. Uh, um, you know, what to prepare for during reading week, right, our, mm -hmm. our, our spring break. Um, and one of the big things was um, keep in mind to balance the time, that mm -hmm. not only do you need to, you know, get caught up on your readings <laughs> and studying, because that's what it's for. To last <laughs> yes, because we're, I was always a procrastinator, so I was always behind. Um, but also take care of the self. So mm -hmm. uh, get some good sleep, maybe get a little bit of exercise, eat some decent food, um, <laughs> and connect with some friends and family. So really, really important to have a support network. It can get you through some really 
some really bleak times. Yeah. Yeah. Not that university will be bleak times, yeah. but it can get you through difficult times. Time. Yeah. Mm. Right. And then, uh, I guess going off of that, how do you how do faculty play a supporting role for students? You know, my I've been teaching now since I guess I taught my first course in two thousand and two, so it's been a long time. <laughs> and my my I, ba I I went into it thinking about what were my profess what did my professors mean to me when mm -hmm. I was an undergrad? What role did they play? And the two most significant people in my university experience were two of my professors. I was um, I did my uh, undergrad here at St. Jerome's many years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, two professors in the psychology department, Dr. Tice and Dr. Orlando, were incredible. They helped me to um, figure out who I was just through discussions with them, and sometimes what they'd say back, and I'd think, really, you see me like that? And then I start to think, am I like that? Maybe I am. Yeah, maybe that is part of me. Um, so sometimes just the just the dialogue. So I think that professors can be really important um, mentors mm -hmm. and, and I guess role models, but even more so uh, sounding boards, bouncing boards, sounding boards. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in SMF, in my program, Sexuality, Marriage and Family Studies, uh, it's nice and small, so we get to know students um, pretty well. And... It's wonderful when they just, you know, come by during office hours or just unexpectedly or set up a time and they want to talk about, you know, well, I'm not sure what I want to do with my life. I'm thinking about this, this and this. And we, we chat and afterwards they go, wow, I hadn't thought about things like that. Thanks. That was great. So, wow. Well, you're very welcome. I mean, I thank you for sharing with yeah. me. Um, but I think that professors can, uh, can offer a lot of support and a lot mm. of mentorship um, when there's a good good connection. Yeah. So it's the same with um, finding a therapist, right? And I say to clients when we first meet our first meeting, I say, you know, there are a lot of different personalities in the world, a lot of different people, and not all of them match, right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you just don't get along with someone. They're like, yeah, I know. I say, yeah. <laughs> but in this context, in the therapeutic context, it's really important that it's a fit. And I'm yeah. not a fit for everyone. My personality is, is not a fit for everyone. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that a good fit between the professor and the student if you find that as a student, nurture that, stick mm -hmm. with it, because having someone like that in your life can be helpful. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So that, those are my thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you touched on this a little bit already, but are there any other role models um, mm -hmm. other than the professors you've had mm -hmm. in your life? Oh gosh, so many. <laughs> so many in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. I was in the co-op program when I was an undergrad, and so I did, uh, I was in psychology at the time, and I did uh, co-op placement at a place called uh, the Hinks Farm. We call it the Hinks Farm. Hinks Rural Treatment Center, I guess it was called, as a child and youth worker. And I remember being just amazed at um, the talent, the compassion, the skills of the people working in the field with, young, with, with youth. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me like, oh my God, I'll never be like that. Um, and the, the ways that they used humor to connect with the kids, humor is a da can be a dangerous thing, mm. okay? Because not everybody always gets your humor. Yeah. But they were really down to earth. They were really real and transparent, some of them in particular. And they were, they were significant role models for me thinking about, I knew that I wanted to do work with people down the road. Mm. And I thought, you know, what can I take from watching them from, from these experiences um, in terms of how I want to interact with young people and families when I do that kind of work? So they were important role models for me. Um, who were the two profs that I mentioned for sure. Um, and sometimes um, there are certain, certain family members. So my parents in interesting ways, in, 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 in different ways, right? Learning, you know, uh, how to strength manifest itself differently uh, among people. So um, I remember as a little kid, I thought my mother was invincible. She would carry, and we didn't, we only had one car, and Dad used to go to work, and so we'd walk to the grocery store and buy groceries. And of course, you, know, you have lots of bags of groceries. Yeah, yeah, and Mom yeah. would have like about six bags in each hand, and there's me with my one bag of bread, light, <laughs> woo, swinging away as we walk. Oh, look, I'm helping. And yeah. I just thought, look how strong she is, you know? Um, and so 
I think then I developed a tendency to carry a lot of things all at once. I don't make two trips from the car. No. One trip. I carry every bag I possibly can on me over my shoulder. <laughs> one trip. And I think, you know, I got that from mom. But it's like the idea of strength. There's physical strength and there's emotional strength. And both mm. my parents have um, uh, experienced, you know, a lot of hardships in life as immigrants. And uh, um, they've been role models of strength and uh, and and perseverance in a in a strange land, you know. So university can feel like a strange land to mm. incoming students, right? Mm. So how do you persevere? How do you find strength um, to make it through? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So then, what is the best advice you have ever received? You know, Jen, you let me know if that was going to be a question yeah. you're going to ask me. And so I thought brought. about it, honestly, and then every time I thought of something, I'd take my iPhone out and I'd write things down. <laughs> so I have, like, a list. Okay. The best advice. There are many, <laughs> the many, ones. many. But after reading the book, um, I think the first one that I'll say is um, my grandmother, Donna Tomasina, mm-hmm. uh, used to always say when we were growing up, and I'll see if I can get this right, we're Italian, uh, il sacco vuoto non si regge, which means the empty sack can't uh, uh, hold itself up, can't stay up on its own. Okay. So in reading this book and thinking about self-care and support, that phrase has always stayed with me. I've used it many, many times. Um, and the idea is that you, you have to you have to nurture yourself. You need to take care of yourself if you want to give to others, if you want to support others. So Randy talks about, I love his, uh, uh, oh, it might be a spoiler if I say it. I think it's okay. I think it'll be okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So there's this <laughs> okay. thing he says about when you're in a plane. Anyone who has flown in a plane knows that at the beginning they give all the instructions about where the exits are and they do all this stuff and mm-hmm. they put the oxygen mask on the and they say... Attendance. All the flight attendants, yes, thank you. They always say put your own oxygen mask on first and then help the person next to you. Well, when I think about my grandmother saying, if I am empty and I am depleted, how can I help someone else? I have to take care of myself in order to be helpful to others. And this is something I talk about with parents when I do my clinical work with parents and children, um, that that they need to take care of themselves in order to be there for their kids. Um, And I think that that certainly applies to all of us. So the importance of taking care of oneself, not challenging this idea that it's selfish. Mm. You know, I had a student meet with me the other day about a presentation she's working on, and she said, you know, um, I had to take a couple of days and just take care of myself because I was just feeling depleted. And I looked at myself. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah, she needed it. Because if you're empty, you're not going to put out a good prog- uh, product. Oh, yeah. So keep that in mind when you come to university, that you need mm. to take care of yourself if you're going to do well and if you are going to, if you want to be there for others who may need support. So that was an important piece of advice, and I found myself drawing on that over, over the years. But the other one I also wanted to say was um, I did some volunteer work in Africa, in West Africa, oh. in Ghana, when I finished university. And I was introduced to the Adinkra symbols from West Africa. And I bought um, a little brass um, charm, Mm -hmm. charm, pendant, pendant is the word. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I asked, and I was drawn to the symbol. And I said, you know, what does this mean? And when it was translated to me uh, in English, the person said, well, it means don't forget your roots. Don't forget where you come from. And the actual definition is return and get it the importance of learning from the past but for me it was don't forget your roots don't forget where you come from I've used that a lot I've drawn that a lot it's really important to remember what I where I've come from what I've experienced and how that's gotten me to where I am today and to remember you know some of the humble beginnings so to speak or Mm -hmm. some of the lessons that I've learned over the years some of the connections I've made uh, the people who have influenced me and to keep all those things alive they all they all contribute to make me who I am today, mm. right? Our past is yeah. part of who we are in the present. So that that was an important piece for me as well that I carry with me. So I'll just, those two would stand out right now. Yeah, no, I think those are definitely good advice for students, incoming students. And then the last one that I have for you is kind of a bit of a fun one, but from one of the chapters that we saw, yeah. what would you paint on your wall? Man, I really <laughs> had to think about that. Like, well, what would I paint on my walls? Because I hadn't thought about ever painting on my walls. No. So, um, but I think, um, when I got to thinking about it, I thought I'd like to have stuff around me 
that is, uh, is sort of bright colors and vibrant. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can't see it in the screen, but my <laughs> thing up there okay. um, with the planets and the angle it up so that maybe oh, they can see. There we go. There we go. That, yes. My mom <laughs> brought that back from Venezuela on her first ever trip south. And that has gone from office to office. Unfortunately, the video cut out at the end when we asked, what would you paint on your walls? But Professor Serafini talked about a tapestry that was in her office, which was very colorful and bright, covered in planets and stars. And she talked about how she would paint things like that, very colorful in her room, as well as things to do with travel that, um, that she's done in the past and lots to do with nature as well, surrounding herself with nature and important symbols and messages that she's picked up over the years. Thank you so much, Professor Serafini. It was great talking to you and learning your perspective on the subject of the support network. Here at St. Jerome, you have a great support network available to you. Your academic advisors that are here for you, your student leaders, your residence dons, your campus ministry, and of course, faculty members, which we've talked, to, talked about. So there's a whole network available here for you guys when you get here, so no worries. Yes, of course, there's going to be tough times. There are never on any tough days, but you will meet a lot of people who are here to help you through those times. So for this week are two questions that we want you guys to answer in the discussion on learn. Number one, what is the best advice you've ever received? And number two, what would you paint on your walls? I've ever received it's really hard because you get a lot of advice over the years from a lot of different people and that kind of uh, like we talked about with Professor Serafini knowing your roots that makes you the person who you are um, one I think that kind of stuck out for me was you never know until you try because I've always been a shyer person so I, some of you guys have talked about this a little bit on the discussion boards as well um, being shy and university, um, you want university to be that opportunity to branch out more and I think I'm very similar in that aspect. I definitely took it as an opportunity to reach out more. Um, I never thought I would have the courage to travel um, abroad, um, go away from my family for that long period of time and just go to different countries almost every weekend at one point. Um, but just taking those, you, you don't know how it's going to turn out until you actually take the chance and do it. So that's, that's been pretty important to me. As far as painting my walls, it's really tough. Right now they're covered in posters, so they're kind of already covered. But I guess I would probably have some crazy abstract designs all over there. I kind of want to go a little insane with the paintbrush and just have at her because you know, it just it would turn into a fun a fun game just painting the walls itself it wouldn't even matter what it looked in the end what it looked like uh after this past year definitely lots to do with travel maybe a map i'd want to paint a map and dot all the places that i've been and then continue that um as hopefully i'll travel more in the future and write down all the places that i go oh in first year residence we had a quote board in the hallway so if anyone said anything funny or something like that we'd write it down on the board and so I think I'd probably want to add one of those on my wall just to just things that I hear whether it's good advice or just a funny quote I'd want to I'd want to write it there and then lastly the paint that you get that lets you put a chalkboard I'd want one of those so I could put a to-do list on my wall because I really need to look and see all the things that I need to get done in a day because um, I usually typically just make that list in my head and I'm more apt to forget things that way. So hopefully if I had some sort of chalkboard that I could write on, then I would remember all those things or at least be forced to look at them. So that would be really good. So yeah, if you guys write your answers in the discussion board on Learn, we'll be keeping an eye on those. This week's prize winner is going to be announced in the description below. I'm filming this a little earlier in the week, so when this is posted, we'll know by then. I want to give you guys as much time as possible so that you can answer the question um, for your chance to win a prize. However, if you do not win the prize this week, you also have an opportunity the following week because we'll be picking another person to have a chance to win a prize. So definitely keep writing on those discussion boards. We love hearing from you guys, um, and then you have another chance to win.
So I will see you guys next week. Next week we're going to look at chapters 6 to 11. So really looking at Randy's dreams and how he accomplished those. Um, so it's going to be a great read. So I will see you guys next week. And uh, yeah, see you later. Bye.